Please welcome Christine Braden, Head of Europe, City and Chief Executive Officer, Citibank Europe. Declan Kelleher, Senior Advisor, APCO Worldwide. Michael O'Leary, Chief Executive Officer, Ryanair. And Bloomberg's Reto Grigori. Morning, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the show so far. Um, we have Christine, head of City, uh, but she's also spent many years in Asia, so she can give us an international perspective. Declan, uh, senior advisor at APCO, but also Ireland's former permanent representative to the EU, as well as ambassador to China. Um, and then, of course, Michael O'Leary, soft-spoken CEO of uh, Ryanair. <laughs> Uh, one of the men who uh, changed the way we fly, um, and also one of the most outspoken critics of Brexit, often calling the pro-Brexit camp idiots, or worse. Uh, we're here to, here to talk about uh, navigating Europe's new business landscape, which is a nice euphemism for dealing with the post-Brexit mess. Uh, we'll also talk about the war in Ukraine and the worsening China-US relationship and what it means uh, for Europe. Um, I'd like to kick off with a very simple question. Has the whole Brexit process been messier, less messy, or as messy as you expected way back in 2016? And while you're answering, we're also asking you in the audience the same question. So please take out your phone. There's a um, QR code there, hopefully. Um, so do vote. Um, let me start with you, Christine. Um, worse than expected? Better than feared? Or you know, look, when I think about uh, Brexit, I think the biggest moment was actually when we went for a hard Brexit. I think everybody was hoping for something a little bit different. But um, since then, uh, my general view is that actually where we are today is, you know, we don't look in the rearview mirror of what happened with Brexit. If we look forward, we would actually see that more is to come. And uh, particularly for our financial services industry, I break that into three things. The first one is, you know, right at Brexit, we had to move our clients. We're now in the process of moving our people. Why? In part because uh, COVID put a bit of a pause on international relocations. Um, and now we're sort of in phase three, which is effectively moving our products. And uh, this week is an actually really important week because we will be uh, receiving some of the results from our regulators on their future expectations. And as a result, there'll be a lot of uh, moves. So. Maybe the messier part is yet to come. <laughs> okay. What about you, Declan? You had a front row seat both before and after the referendum. What's your take? Well, I think Brexit, first of all, Brexit was always going to be a process and not an event. Uh, and Brexit is probably messier than it should have been, but is about as messy as I think one would have, would have forecast. Um, from an Irish perspective, it posed existential problems for Ireland, both in relation to maintaining the, the gossamer's web, the very careful network of nuance that underpinned the peace process in Northern Ireland. Uh, also, given that Ireland is the UK's fifth largest export market, there's a huge amount of bilateral commerce and trade. It presented great issues for us there because while Northern Ireland had its own deal, Brexit means Brexit, and it means trade barriers, it means an end to regulation, EU regulation, it means a lot of distortions and a lot of friction. So um, was it as messy as we thought it would be? Probably was, and I tell you why, because of the fundamental mismatch between, if you like, rational policy in the UK and what was, in a sense, performative ideology in the UK. And I think that was the problem. Uh, we could have had the deal, the so-called Windsor deal, several years ago, but uh, the Johnson government simply did not want a deal on those terms. So a uh, long answer to your question, but messy, it's a process. The process will go on for a long time, even now, as we find the new normal. But I, I think basically the fundamental solution has been arrived at. So there's a lot to work for, but it could have been a lot less messy than it has been. Right. Michael, we know how you feel, uh, but can you give us some specific examples how you had to change your business uh, to handle the fallout? Well, I think you made it clearly it has been um, considerably messier than it should have been. Uh, sadly, the same career liars and ambitious idiots who 
promoted Brexit were then put in charge of the negotiations of the leaving. Uh, they negotiated the Northern Ireland Framework Agreement and then immediately repudiated it. Uh, everything that was promised to the UK population, uh, the sunny uplands and the ability to do trade deals with everywhere around the world were shown to be another tissue of lies. Um, so it has been unbelievably messy, much messier than we thought, but then I think we mistakenly assumed that there would be some kind of competence at the top of the UK government under Johnson and they would at least put the economy first and do a sensible deal. It turned out that that was completely delusional, uh, just like Johnson and the rest of his Brexit cohort. Um, I am a bit more optimistic now, though I think with uh, the combination of uh, Rishi Sunak and um, Hunt uh, as Chancellor, there's a, some adults back in the room. I think the Stormont framework is a, an immeasurably better uh, deal. Uh, I think there's been considerable movement on the UK side and on the European side. Uh, and I think there's a framework there for moving forward. Ultimately, we need some sort of a sensible trading agreement between the UK and the European Union. The TPP is never going to replace in the UK economy what uh, a sensible trade deal with the European Union would provide. Um, and we would hope that, that in those improving relations, if they can solve the challenges of the North, in Northern Ireland and get Stormont back working again, I would personally call for an early election and flush out the, the unionists. But I think there's a real prospect going forward. As a business, we face huge challenges in the UK. Uh, the labour market is broken. It is incredibly difficult to hire people in the UK. And we, you know, we are hiring cabin crew pilots. We pay well above retail hospitality. Um, we're bringing in uh, Europeans and non-Europeans on visa programmes. Uh, the UK government is scamming us for visas. and It costs £3,000 for a visa to bring in a non-UK uh, cabin crew uh, and our pilot. Um, uh, which is just another cost of doing business now in the we'll UK. We'll actually get back to the, uh, the Labour market in mm. a second. Uh, Christine, the uh, Windsor Agreement or framework, do you think we're over the hunt for what, what else needs to be done? I mean, from our perspective, I think we're, we're glad to see the pragmatism that's coming through this framework. Um, in the Ireland, island of Ireland, we have about 6,500 people, so we care very much about the ability to just have a level playing field for doing business. And so we're... Glad to see the progress. And Declan, Windsor. Well, the Windsor Agreement is is a big plus. Um, I think you can look at it at several levels. First of all, in relation to the Northern Ireland situation, it's a win-win. Uh, full access to the EU single market and a full access to the UK internal market. So it makes absolute economic and business sense. Uh, it's calmed down. Um, the political issues in Northern Ireland, with a huge amount of commitment by not only the Irish government, but also by the European Union and the US government too, the, the Biden administration and former presidents. Um, at another level, however, I think it's worth recalling that this, Northern Ireland was always going to be a unique issue, and that's why there's a special deal. Uh, Brexit more generally, between member states of the Union and the UK, those barriers are still there. Uh, and they're actually going to increase because the UK, for its own reasons, has, has not imposed full controls. Um, but I think business is going to find when the UK does, the things are going to become even, even more difficult. Um, the, uh, Michael mentioned the CPTPP, the, this, this, um, this, European, this Asian uh, trade agreement, which will add precisely 0.08% uh, of um, GNP to the UK economy. But also I think there are three other aspects which are actually legacies of Brexit are worth taking account of. One is the British had to make concessions on palm oil with Malaysia. They had to make concessions on agriculture with Canada, who said, well, you agreed this with Canada, New Zealand, why not with us? And the third thing is there was a delay in British accession to the CPTPP because uh, the rest of the world saw what went on in relation to trying to depart from international law on Northern Ireland. So uh, I think Windsor is very good. Uh, it's the basis for a better relationship between uh, the EU and the UK. It's certainly extremely good from a Northern Ireland perspective, but 
what really matters is what attitude the British government is going to take, where it wants to pitch and situate its relationship with the European Union as we go forward. I think that's going to be crucial. Let's talk about the regulations or the diverging <coughs> regula uh, regulatory landscape. I mean, how do you handle this, Michael? Uh, with great difficulty and with some complexity. I mean, for us to fly now from UK airport to non-EU destinations like Morocco, Turkey, we've had to set up a Ryanair UK, a UK airline, UK AOC, none of which is really necessary. It adds nothing, but it's another uh, layer of, uh, of regulation, bringing people in. And there is a huge infrastructure, there's huge um, inflexibilities now in the UK labour market. We're hiring cabin crew who we pay between 30 and 40,000 sterling a year. Uh, and there's nobody, in, not enough people in the UK to take up those jobs. It's not just us, EasyJet, the other Jet2, those other airlines. Is there something that the government, the UK government, could do to? Uh... But there is. We've had a number of meetings with the, uh, the tra Department of Transport, the Aviation Minister, Baroness Varzi, um, who's not the brightest sandwich in the picnic basket, um, asking them to reduce. <laughs> that reduce... was a technical term. It I is assume. a technical term. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's had a very distinguished career running girls' schools, but aviation is really not her forte. And the, you know, the industry has come up with some very specific asks. One, can we have more flexibility in hiring people, not just for the airlines, but at airports, uh, bring people in, reduce the ludicrous cost of these visas from, say, 3,000. They would tell you, she would tell you, oh, this is the, co the, the cost the Home Office imposes. Well, you're profiteering on the back of this thing. If you want to have a visa, we, pr we, we do all the work, but reduce the cost of the visas to 500 or 1,000 pounds, but there's no justification for 3,000 pounds. Um, she's promised to look at it, but you know, it will be two and a half years. She'll still be looking at it in two years' time. There'll be no action. And the problem we find all the time in dealing with the government, uh, despite the fact that there's been changes at the top in the UK, there is a, this obsession with finding, uh, in most government departments, finding excuses or show us somewhere where Brexit has benefited. Brexit, Brexit benefits. I mean, they don't want to know about the Brexit. Uh, and to be fair, we're one of the few industries that can, I think the only industry that can point to a Brexit benefit. Duty free is back on flights to and from Europe. About the only upside we can find to Brexit. You can now buy booze and fags. You can buy, right? you can buy booze and fags again. But we would happily forego the sale of booze and fags if you could get a sensible trade deal between the UK and the European Union. <laughs> Christine, uh, do you use duty free? Or, um, but what, for you in, in finance, I mean, how hard is it to find uh, people in London, and more important, how difficult is it to find traders all over Europe? I mean, what's what's your experience? Yeah, look, we're, we're not having trouble finding new people in the UK, um, but what I think is interesting is we're seeing actually uh, a bit of a diaspora. Um, so when we are needing to have people come back into Europe. First of all, people are sort of choosing their nationality. So if they're Italian, they want to go back to Italy. If they're Greek, they want to go back to Greece, etc. And so rather than going from sort of a one location in the UK, we're going to a many locations on the continent, and that is fragmenting the industry a little bit. Um, I think it will eventually land in a couple different locations. I mean, Ireland will be definitely a beneficiary of that. We continue to grow here. But um, we are needing to have, you know, trading capabilities move into Europe. A lot of that is landing in Paris um, so far, but I, my call would be that it's probably going to land in a couple different locations, not just Paris over time. Declan, your view? Well, <clears throat> Ireland did not only, <clears throat> or did not first develop um, the promotion of foreign inward direct investment with Brexit. There's, there's been a long, long a policy, a very successful and well-oiled policy. Um, the IDA have, have punched above their weight on this in a very substantial way. And um, the jobs coming in do not, in my view, compensate for the fact of Brexit. It is unfortunate that the UK, which was like-minded on business, on trade, on a whole load of regulatory issues, has left the European Union. It's altered the balances a little bit within the EU. But having said that, uh, I think Ireland is right to make the best of it. Uh, and I agree that um, because we are um, English speaking, although lots of other EU member states now are English speaking, we have a pro-business approach. Um, we have a good relationship both with Brussels and with the US. And we've intensified our relationship with other EU member states since Brexit. We've opened offices, more offices in France and Germany in particular. Um, Ireland has been active and agile in gearing to make the most 
of a bad job, and Brexit's a bad job, by making Ireland more attractive for inward investment, and by also looking at our alliances within the European Union. I mentioned just a moment ago that the UK used to be the big member state that had a kind of liberal approach to trade, pro-business. The UK have gone, and in the world of qualified majority voting in the EU, it was important for Ireland to recalibrate. So we have, in a sense, become more North European since the British have left. Um, we have economic uh, similarities with a number of the Nordics, the Dutch, the Baltic states. So we've repositioned ourselves. And I think that process of being agile and constant repositioning is an important element of, of uh, how we, we continue to, to do, I hope, do well in the European Union. Christine, coming back to London, I mean, when all is said and done, how big or how small is City going to be in the city, um, and how big are you going to be in, in, in the rest of Europe? So look, I mean, I'll just put it into some perspective already. So we've got 15,000 people in Europe, and we've got roughly eight on, uh, in the UK. But interestingly, the UK has been growing, um, despite you know, the sort of rebalancing. Why is that? Um, I think it's growing because we continue to have that as our EMEA hub, um, but also we do continue to find really good talent in, in London. And so I think London will stay a financial center. It will stay our MIA hub. We'll just have a rebalancing onto the continent. And actually, the numbers of who has moved across aren't that big. So it's sort of in the 200 level. And if you think about 15,000 people, that's sort of not that material. Um, and so I do think both will basically continue to grow and continue to be very relevant. What will change, though, and the big thing that's changing, is actually the risk-taking is what's going to move. And so we've historically had risk-taking in the UK. That risk-taking and the assets that go with it, not the people alone, but the assets that go with it, that's the next phase of what we're now moving into. And that will be a material change. Michael, have you shifted workers? Not particularly. I mean, we tend to be more opportunistic. So, you know, we allocate our growth to those airports who need it most. There's been huge growth opportunities in our business post-COVID. We've seen a dramatic downshift in aircraft capacity across Europe. Airlines like Thomas Cook have gone bust. Alitalia has only come back 50% the size it was pre-COVID. TAP is only 60% the size it was pre-COVID. So we tend to allocate. We're taking 50 aircraft, new aircraft from Boeing in advance of the summer, that's that they can actually deliver them. But we, uh, we are distributing those all across uh, Europe. We are still growing in the UK. I mean, one of the interesting things, I think with the demise of Thomas Cook, cutbacks in flood, the, the, the liquidation of Fly B, there have been opportunities at UK airports. So we're growing. We've opened up a new base in Belfast this summer. We're expanding in Bristol, in Birmingham. We're still growing in Stansted. There are, and there, you know, we've been greeted with enormous demand from uh, UK people, uh, passengers and their families going to the beaches of Europe on summer holidays. I think people have been locked up for two or three years during COVID. I'm surprised at the strength of spending in the, uh, in the European economy at the moment for all of the talk of um, fuel poverty and uh, consumer price inflation. There is full employment and people are receiving, getting paid at the end of every month and they are spending and certainly they're spending on travel. Uh, which means, unfortunately, in our industry, the next crisis is probably about two days away. But nevertheless, <laughs> business is, uh, is booming yeah. and getting boomier. Always look at the bright side of life. <laughs> Except for uh, the airline industry. We didn't actually uh, comment on the poll at all. The, the first one where about 90% of you agreed that it was either as messy or messier than uh, uh, people expected. We'll have a second poll now and also a question to you. It's more the long-term view. It's interesting, interesting that you both say that you actually keep, you keep growing in the UK despite all the, uh, all the difficulties. And so the question is, and please again, uh, audience, do vote. Long-term, will Britain be better off or about the same or worse off with uh, uh, the Brexit? Um, somebody had a net. Somebody was very quick and ne negative there. Uh, but anyway, let's take a 20-year view. Where, if we're all alive, then where do you think we'll be in terms of Britain and Europe? Declan? <clears throat> I'm reminded of what probably the most distinguished US Secretary of State of the 20th century, Dean Acheson said uh, he was working for John F. Kennedy as an advisor back in 1962 at a commencement ceremony at West Point, where he said, Great Britain has lost an empire but not yet found a role. 
and this caused a huge stink. Uh, the Macmillan government wanted to throw out the American ambassador, recall the British ambassador. Um, but nobody paid attention to the next sentence of what Acheson said was, but the solution to this is by joining the European Economic Community. So um, I think if you look at it in the long perspective, um, you can wonder why the UK did this so counter to their interests if you look at the drop in growth, the, 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 the problems in productivity, the drop in basically household wealth in the UK. You could also wonder why they did it now uh, at a time of geopolitical turmoil that hasn't been seen for 50 years in which uh, you know if you're on your own you're a cork bobbing on the edge of a whirlpool. Um, and you have to ask, where will the UK go on this? Uh, now there's talk about the UK rejoining the European Union. I think that raises very many questions. I don't think that's going to happen in the short term. Um, and remember, the UK, when it left the Union, had a whole series of special deals. Agricultural budget rebate, uh, opt-outs on monetary union, opt-outs on justice and home affairs, and other things. And those will not be granted. If, if there is a rejoin. But the final point, and I think this kind of goes to the heart of your question, there's a problem, and this is from my experience uh, dealing with Brexit as Irish permanent representative, there's a problem with both the Brexiteers and the Remainers. They tend to misjudge what's required to have a close relationship with the EU. I mean, look at Switzerland. I mean, uh, the Sunak uh, government said, let's do what the Swiss are doing. The Swiss, uh, first of all, apply full freedom of movement. Secondly, pay into the EU budget. And third, accept dynamic EU regulation, over which they have no say. I simply don't see the UK um, public opinion in the short term going down that road. So uh, in sum, um, it's bad for the UK. It'll continue to be bad for the UK. They will readjust. They're joining CPTP. <laughs> they're joining other trade deals, all of which, or most of which, are replications of what the EU has already done with those third countries. But there's going to be a problem down the road of how you manage that fundamental contradiction in opinion in Britain, wanting to be close to the EU, but not wanting to do what's necessary. What the European Union calls the balance of rights and obligations. Christine, are you with the majority here, or 84 percent of you think ne negative? Look, I, I tend to agree with Declan. I think its role in financial services will have to be reshaped, and um, it had the benefit of having the entire European continent operating its financial services industry from London. That is a major change, and I think that is a net negative for the city. Um, and I do think that Europe will have a net positive over time. But I do also think that Europe has some work to do. You know, we still have to improve the banking union, the capital markets union. We need to create an internal market that is actually a true internal market with free flow of capital. And that doesn't happen today. And so I think the EU also has some work to do to take full advantage of what's just changed and not land in a place where we have continued fragmentation on the continent. Michael. I think 20 years is too far out because you know, there's much that the UK can do over that period of time. But I think for the next, the medium, the short to medium term, the next three to five years, is the, the Brexit will be net negative on the UK economy, no question about it. Um, what happens over the longer term depends on what you know, the British establishment or the UK, future UK governments do. One, I do think ultimately they will finish up in the next 10 or 15 years putting some kind of I call it a trade deal with Europe similar to Norway or Switzerland. I disagree with Declan. I think they will pay into a, a European budget. I think they will have no choice. It is too big. The, the, the fundamental strength of the European, of the single market, is something that is too attractive for the UK economy to be excluded from. Um, and I think that will happen. In the next five to ten years, you will have quite a number of the Brexiteers will die um, because they're. <laughs> The average age of them are generally about over 70 years, over 70 years, and I think there's still a huge majority of the younger people in the UK coming through are much more pro-European. You know, they miss out on things like Erasmus, which is a tragedy, uh, and they will are much more pro-European in their outlook. Um, uh, I think it also a lot depends on what the how Europe responds to Brexit. You know, Europe Brexit should come as a real warning to the European Union. You need to focus on the things that improve people's lives, which is improving the single market. 
and focus less on the political bullshit that actually does nothing for uh, your citizen, for citizens in Europe. I mean, I think Henry Kissinger was still right. You know, when you want to call Europe, who do you call? Nobody knows. But there is much, and I think as Christian said, on the banking side, in our industry, we still have tiny French air traffic control unions shutting down the single market on a weekly basis at the moment. The French very cleverly use minimum service legislation to protect all the French domestic flights, and they cancel all the overflights. We keep shouting at uh, Ursula von der Leyen, you and the European Commission, what are you doing to protect the single market? And all we're met with is silence. Why is Europe not using minimum service legislation to protect overflights? And if the French want to go on strike, which they are perfectly free to do so, let the French flights take the cancellation yeah, because they deserve yeah. them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, much depends on what Europe does or right. how Europe responds to Brexit. Uh, I'd like to zoom out a little bit beyond Brexit. Obviously, we, we're still dealing with the war in Ukraine. Uh, we also have what it all be, what it means for energy uh, supplies in Europe. We also have the worsening U.S.-China relationship, EU-U.S. relationship, not as great as it could be. Uh, how do you navigate this as a businessman, businesswoman, Christine? I mean, look, I think it's, um, when I talk about what's happened in the last couple of years, right, it has been pressure testing uh, across every p potential dimension. And I think that has required a ton of uh, agility and a ton of ingenuity. But actually, Europe's done pretty well, and they've chosen to work quickly um, with various programs to get out ahead of whether it was the pandemic packages or the energy packages. And if you think about the headlines this morning about energy storage, you know, the fact that at this point in the year we're almost at full storage, that's terrific, but that has been at huge cost and huge um, requirements to be agile in this environment. I think that's, that's what we will need to continue to position ourselves around because we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, but the good news is I think the EU in particular has shown its agility to work pretty quickly in what is otherwise could be a slow moving animal, so mm. it's been positive. Michael, if you exclude the French labour unions? I mean, I see all of these, you know, as, as huge opportunities. Uh, there is no crisis that doesn't present an opportunity to your business. We've gone through two years of COVID where the airline industry was grounded. We went back to Boeing, negotiated more aircraft at a lower price. And as a result of that, we, we're, we are expanding at a much faster rate post-COVID in Ryanair. This summer, we'll operate at about 130% of our pre-COVID volumes in a market where people are paying higher airfares for travel because of the pent-up release demand for travel. Every one of these issues creates an opportunity for your business. So the question is, how do you target those opportunities? Where's the opportunity for your business to expand, to lower costs, to capture more customers, or to offer a better service to customers? And in Rhino, that's what we're trying to focus on all the time. So we see and try to treat each of these potential crises as a, one of the ones we're working on at the moment is how do we charge back into Ukraine as soon as uh, the European authorities say it's safe to fly in Ukraine again. Now, nobody knows when that is going to be. But we were Ukraine's second largest airline when the Russians invaded on the 24th of February last year. We would be Ukraine's biggest airline the week after they tell us it's safe to go back in there because we're going to charge back in there. Initially, we have a plan to open up about 30 routes from four Ukrainian airports back into the European Union. And then we want to, I think, in the first within six to 12 months, open up three or four large bases in Ukraine. And we're talking to the Ukrainian authorities about creating an environment cost agreement on which we could lead the charge of air travel uh, into a post-war Ukrainian recovery. Mm. When, if... Don't clap, it only encourages me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how quickly could it go back in? I mean, do you have p people on standby, or it's, we go it's back in? It, we, I mean, like, we could fly back in there in about a week, two weeks. To yes. fill, it takes about two weeks to fill the seats. We have hired in the last, I think, twelve months. We've hired about sixty Ukrainian pilots. I think we have about eighty Ukrainian cabin crew, mainly in our Polish bases. We're actively <laughs> trying to hire. Uh, you know, and there are again EU issues with that because of Ukrainian license. We need to get converted to YASA licenses, but. We are actively looking at ways and creating opportunities where we can charge back into Ukraine because Ukraine will need a lot of redevelopment. Uh, the Russians will probably blow up the roads and the bridges on the way out the door. Uh, uh, and you know, the first way we'll move people into Ukraine will be flights. 
Uh, but we'll be back in there hopefully to, uh, within two weeks after that somebody tells us it's safe to fly back into Kiev, Lviv, Odessa. Kherson will be a lot longer because it's, uh, and the airport has been destroyed. Um, we would be, I see Ukraine as a huge opportunity for European uh, businesses um, you know, to participate and to accelerate uh, the, the recovery of Ukraine post the, 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 the war. Declan, what's your view on opportunities amid all the crises? Well, opportunity is probably the wrong word, but uh, it's a positive thing that one of the positives that's emerged from the negatives of Brexit, uh, the pandemic, and obviously the, the, uh, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is that the European Union has rediscovered the importance of unity. Uh, and that is, if you look at it uh, from the point of view of even data, um, that's very clear. The European Union has stuck together. It stuck together on Brexit, uh, to the benefit of Ireland in particular. It stuck together on the pandemic. Um, and it also has stuck together on Ukraine, if you look at the progressive rounds of sanctions, if you look at the fact that some important kind of uh, crossing points have been forwarded. For example, the EU is now agreeing to supply weaponry and ammunition to Ukraine as something that would be unthinkable a few years ago. So the European Union is developing and is integrating uh, because of these crises. And I think that fits in with Michael's point that there are resources in the EU, there are kind of political uh, currents in the EU that are going to make it, um, I think, very possible for business to thrive in a post-war situation in Ukraine, because the European Union will want to rebuild Ukraine and will want to devote very substantial resources to this. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in, in, in brief, I think they're, they're the, the main themes I would, I would mention. We're almost out of time, but Christine, any, uh, what's your big message to the audience if you run a big business in Europe? What should you do? Well, look, I, on, I think I agree very much with what Declan just said. I think um, in some ways, as a result of these crises, um, actually Europe is much more unified and it's also becoming a security block, which I think is very interesting. And so from my perspective, I am not very optimistic about the future for Europe. Um, and it will, you know, financial services is changing, business dynamics are changing, but there are, there are opportunities around every corner. And just as an aside on the... Uh, Ukraine situation, we actually stayed in the country and we continue to operate there, so we look forward to welcoming you when you arrive. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, any last thoughts? I agree with both Christine and Declan. I would think the future, I'd be optimistic for the future. I do think Europe should treat Brexit as a challenge to it. How do we improve the single market? Mm -hmm. We need less, regu less inefficient regulation. You know, I would personally tackle the French air traffic control unions. <laughs> I want to see a reduction in uh, environmental taxation on short-haul European air travel. Uh, at the moment, we continue to have this ludicrous system where long-haul flights to and from Europe, which account for 55% of Europe's aviation CO2 emissions, are exempt. So the richest people travelling at the highest fares are exempt. And the poor people going and their families on holidays are paying all the environmental taxes. We don't argue there should be zero environmental taxes. There should be environmental taxes. But let the rich business guys travelling from China and America should be paying their fair share. So I think the challenge for the European Commission is more effective regulation. Refocus your efforts. The Commission needs to refocus its efforts on improving the single market and making Europe, uh, the, the lives of its citizenry in Europe better. And that's ultimately the way to prevent further uh, departures like Brexit. That's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>